Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Holotube. You don't have Matthias today, so you have to go with me. Uh, but we are very happy to have um, Jay Armas from Amsterdam telling us about uh, hydrodynamic theory for condensed matter systems. So let me give you the floor and please, Jay, go ahead. And okay. As usual, you can ask questions whenever you want. Okay, uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, uh, I, I do have, I, I will talk about uh, hydrodynamic theory for condensed matter systems, but I should be very clear from, from the outset that even though I have a very promising title, I'm, you know, I, I'm just going to uh, talk about very small steps towards that uh, big sort of project that I have been developing with collaborators for, for some time now. So, the talk I'm giving today is, is mostly based on the paper that came out yesterday with uh, Eric von Heumann and um, Akash Jain and Ruben Lien, um, all excellent people, uh, all of them soon in Amsterdam. So Ruben is, is, is joining Amsterdam as a postdoc very soon. And it's also based on earlier works, one that came out last year with Akash Chain and Ruben Lie, and also some others from previous years that I developed with uh, Akash Chain. Also from the outset, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm a high energy uh, physicist, uh, uh, very trained in, in, in sort of formal techniques, not so much uh, in, in experimental condensed matter systems, but uh, I want to motivate the work, even though I'm more interested in the formal aspects, I do want to motivate the work by some experimental setups um, that observe the sort of phenomena that I'm interested in in this talk. And uh, I want to start with this schematic diagram of uh, copper oxides, uh, which just shows uh, schematically the various phases that they can be in, depending on various parameters, in this case, the temperature and whole doping. And it's just to portray the fact that there are many types of phases in matter that materials can exhibit, um, including charge density wave states, um, spin density wave states, superconductivity, uh, et cetera, et cetera, various forms of crystallization. And I am interested mostly in trying to understand the near equilibrium dynamics of these phases, how to describe them from a more formal point of view. And so in general, uh, my motivations are, are, are very formal. How do, how do we consistently formulate such phases of matter? How do we account for dissipative effects? How do we formulate this in terms of an effective field theory or in terms of a gradient expansion with the minimal uh, um, possible number of assumptions. So I, I, I particularly hate ad hoc assumptions on field content and transport. So I try to be a bit more, um, a bit more formal about it. And how do you characterize such phases in terms of symmetries? How many transport coefficients? How many response coefficients, etc.? Uh, how do you describe all equilibrium states in terms of an effective action or a partition function, etc.? And how do you incorporate in each phase various effects? Because each of these phases, you could argue, uh, can come with additional features, uh, such as phase relaxation or the inclusion of topological defects, uh, plasticity, which will be uh, the big uh, topic of this talk, and other things like magnetic fields, uh, external magnetic fields, dynamic electromagnetic fields, impurities, that may or, or may not have additional symmetry principles, some of which we know, some of which we don't yet know, and might not be possible to describe them in that way. So for this specific talk, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the process of crystallization. So this can happen at various scales in very, various types of, of matter. So here there's a, a picture of, of a normal salt with a salt crystal with the two types of uh, atom sites. Here, there's a Wigner crystal, uh, an observation of a Wigner crystal, which is a state of matter where electrons spontane spontaneously crystallize. And here, there's a, a depiction of a charge density wave in which due to electron phonon interactions, again, they, they, there is some charge distribution, ordered charge distribution forming on top of some lattice. 
But of course, crystals are ubiquitous in, in nature. They, they also show up in, in biomineralization, in, uh, in crystals made out of, uh, of starfish embryos or, or in coral reefs. So, so these phases of matter are there at all scales. And in fact, the only ingredients that I'm going to assume in this talk is just the fact that there is some translation order that can be broken or not, but some form of crystallization. So even though I focus very much on condensed matter applications, in particular electronic crystals, the story is more general than that. And in this specific talk, I'm interested in describing uh, the dynamics of topological defects. When you, when you combine it with this process of crystallization, you can have these defects called topological defects. And there has been some uh, signatures of this uh, also in, in, uh, in, in condensed matter six systems. In, um, and, and here you see one, which is a, a topological defect in a, in a smectic crystal. So uh, that there's translational order along one of the directions. And here is, is uh, one picture of a study that I came to know recently because of my collaboration with uh, Eric von Heumann about uh, sort of destabilizing a two-dimensional isotropic Charles density wave state and looking at how it uh, restores back to equilibrium, what is the dynamics of that process. And there is some evidence that these topological defects are, are, are mediating some of the properties that are seen there. So these are all just sort of motivations uh, for why I'm interested in this specific topic right now. So I'll uh, continue also by saying that uh, I'm also interested in what this has to say about the dynamics of black brains in general in string theory. It's just a very difficult, uh, a very different type of uh, motivation, but this is how I actually uh, was led into this because I was studying the dynamics of black brains in supergravity and all these effects are there. So you can you can introduce these fields, they describe different black brains and 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 their dynamics are in the end described by dynamics of, of these fields that also describe crystallization. So the outline for my talk, given this very short motivation, is to go into very uh, uh, nitty details about uh, how do you describe crystals and, and, and what do we mean by plasticity. So here I have to say that we formulated this in, in a different way than it's usually formulated. So I, I think it's interesting to highlight and also make the connection with topological defects. I should say that plasticity that we're talking about is kind of ignorant about what is the microscopic origin of these uh, of, of, of the plasticity itself. So it, it doesn't assume that the origin is topological defects, but um, we can show later that topological defects provide one example of plasticity, but it could work for other crystals, including amorphous crystals, et cetera, for which you don't know the origin of, of plasticity. And then I will combine this, uh, this theory with pinning, so with, uh, with uh, impurities, with a background lattice that describes, for instance, impurities or just a background lattice of ions, and then try to see what are the, the sort of competing effect, effects between this plasticity and pinning. And then I will try to conclude with some uh, interesting open directions. So uh, maybe before I continue, I can just ask if anyone has any question about my motivations. If not, I will just go forward. No, doesn't look like, so I'll just move forward. So because not everyone is familiar with uh, defects, even though I can see that uh, many, many of the people who are here are, are, uh, live, live of this, uh, this is a, a, a picture of two dimensional of a two dimensional lattice and as you probably know, though I want to make it clear there's many different types of defects. Um, that are portrayed here in this uh, uh, picture from a book um, and i'm focusing on the ones that have these red circles around it, if you see so i'll, I'll try to write a theory that that can inter, you know take into account these locations that can take into account. Um, what's called interstitials and, and vacancies of, of the same type of matter. And I'll also try to include uh, uh, what's called impurity atoms or substitutional impurity atoms modeled by some background lattice. 
So it's not dynamical, these impurity lattices in my impurity atoms in my specific case. And also, I should say that I'm not describing this microscopically. I'm describing a big density of these things. So I'm in a macroscopic regime uh, in which there's, there's many of these defects. So let me try to uh, uh, introduce uh, what, I, what, what the necessary ingredients to describe crystals and plasticity from, from my point of view. So uh, a, a theory of crystals uh, necessarily requires two different spaces. One is crystal space, um, which is defined by uh, uh, a set of fields uh, that we call lattice fields or crystal fields. Some people are also call goldstone fields or phason fields. There's many names for them. And these fields, they basically describe the locations of the lattice sites or the lattice cores. So the, the values of this field will tell you the positions of these lattice sites here. And then there is a background space, which is the physical space, if you want, or the space time, if I'm looking at relativistic geometries, or space and time, if I'm not looking at relativistic geometries, but I'm looking at non-relativistic geometries, such as Aristotelian space or newton carton space. So I can describe real non-relativistic crystals, which is mostly what I'm going to do. In fact, I'm just going to keep it general, describe the most general uh, crystal without imposing any boost symmetry. And then I can specialize to uh, either Galilean systems or relativistic systems. So I just keep that open. And I'm going to assume for now that the crystal is homogeneous. That means that there is no energy cost by just shifting the lattice sites by a constant AI. And that means that all the dependence uh, of the crystal fields in the theory that I'm going to make, it only comes with, with what is called the crystal frame fields. That is basically a derivative on these, on these uh, uh, crystal fields. So it kills the constant shift. And, and this crystal field that basically provides a projector between these two spaces. So I can take a field in the background, project it back into crystal space, uh, or pull it back, or I can take fields in crystal space and push forward to the background. So this is a way of, of describing the crystal. You will see why, because now I need an, an extra ingredient. This is not enough to describe the crystal. And so if you have this crystal, you can define what is called an induced metric on the crystal, which is basically just the contraction with the background metric of the crystal frame fields. So you have some uh, field, uh, the lattice frame field, um, the lattice field in the background, and you can act with the derivative, you pull it back to the crystal space and you can see how did the uh, uh, distances between lattice uh, sites changed with respect to something. And that something is the reference metric which I defined here. So there is an uh, H reference IJ, which is an intrinsic property of the crystal. I, I just give it in, it's an input. And that basically describes the natural state of the distances between these lattice sites if the crystal has not been strained in any way. So it's this natural rest state. And of course, if I take the induced metric on the crystal and I subtract it with the reference metric, that's what you call the strain tensor divided. You know, if you put a half in there is, is what you call the strain tensor. So if there is differences in distances, once I compare the two metrics, uh, there will be a strain acting on the crystal. Now, the physics of crystals should be invariant under redefinitions of the lattice sites. So the way I've redefined my five fields, I, I define my five fields shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't affect the physics. So there is a diffeomorphism symmetry on the five fields, a, a normal diffeomorphism symmetry that acts on the five fields in this way here. And that transforms both the induced metric and the intrinsic reference metric in the usual way with a, a, a normal diffeomorphism transformation on metrics. So in fact, the two metrics are not physical objects per se, because they, tra they transform under diffeomorphisms. But the physical strain, which is the projection of this 
crystal strain with the crystal frame fields is invariant under diffeomorphism. So it's a physical object. So once you build the effective theory, you have to take into account this strain as the real physical object if it's going to be invariant under those symmetries. Now, you can also define what's called the crystal velocity, which is basically the time dynamics of the frame of the lattice fields in this specific way. I can define just the, der the time derivative acting on the five fields and project it with the crystal frame fields. Now, it should be obvious right now that I have specialized very much to a flat space. And I'm in generally working, like I said, in, in a norm, in a boost agnostic setting. So I don't impose any boost symmetry. I can always go back to relativistic fields or Galilean or relativistic symmetry or Galilean symmetry, but imposing the right uh, symmetries. But I've, I've specialized to flat space right now. And this crystal velocity uh, allows me to define a local rest frame for the crystal, which basically means that the five fields won't develop in time. So if I act with a time derivative plus the fluid, the, the crystal velocity, these five, uh, five fields remain uh, static. So it's a kind of co-moving frame or a local rest frame. Now, this allows me to basically distinguish what is an elastic crystal from a plastic crystal. So an elastic crystal is basically a crystal in which the reference metric, so the natural straight state of the material, does not in evolve in time with respect to the local rest frame. And that means that I can stretch, I can compress, I can, I can twist, but the, the, the natural state of the material will always be remain the same. You know, you can, you can start thinking why, why this is related to elasticity or not, because if you would stress the material and the material would plastically deform, that means that its local rest state has to change over time because it stays deforming permanently, but elastically it does not. So that's why this is a good definition. And in such cases, it's common to basically fix part of the diffeomorphism symmetry down to global rotations on this on this space, and this allows you to basically fix the local the reference metric of the crystal to just a delta uh, to to a Euclidean metric on the crystal. Now, yeah, Jay, can I ask a question? Hey, yes. uh, can we go back one slide? This condition that you're imposing on the crystal fields, which condition? The the that they're um, that their material derivative is zero. Yes. Is that is that a choice? No, oh, it's, not a cho it's not a choice. It's just what it is. Yeah. Because it seems conceptually distinct from the condition that you're imposing on the reference metric in the next slide, which is the condition that there's no plasticity. So that one, I, I imagine that you're going to- no, this, 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 is a, this is a constraint. The, 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 age, the, the derivative with respect to this field of the reference metric equals to zero is a constraint that you impose on the system if you want to describe a, a purely elastic- Right. Yeah. Right. And so so that, that one you, you are going to, to, to relax in, in just a little bit. Yeah, 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 exactly. I'm, I'm just, why, yeah. why not also relax the previous one? But but this this one is just by definition what it is. So you you get this this is this is not a, it's not a choice. This is just what it is. It's it's there's nothing to relax here because this is just a definition, like like it's trivially zero. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you you see what I mean? It, it's not. Yeah, it's not even the definition, it's trivially zero. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so there's nothing to relax there. Yeah. 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 Is that, is that, does that answer the question? I, I think I maybe need to think a little bit about it. Okay, yeah. okay, but, 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 but it, you can, you can, you can just work it out and it gives you zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, 
So, so th th this was an elastic crystal. Uh, you have to impose this to, to not have any uh, um, plastic deformations. But what is a plastic crystal? So a plastic crystal is just a crystal in which the reference metric evolves dynamically. I'm not telling you how it evolves. I'm going to derive it, how it evolves, but it just evolves. So th there's, no, there's no constraint on the reference metric in that way. And I should just want to make clear that I, I didn't assume anything. On, uh, on, on what is the microscopic origin of this metric. I'm just saying there is a metric and is changing over time. Uh, the natural state is changing over time. And I'm also ignoring what's called uh, bond angle plasticity because there could be some plasticity associated with rotations of the bond angles. So this is more just length. So the, the distances are changing or being deformed permanently. Now, what can you fix in a plastic crystal? So because this metric evolves dynamically and evolves dynamically independently of the crystal fields, I cannot just fix it to be delta IHA like I could anymore. At most, I can fix it at a given time, say at t equals to zero equals to delta IHA. But as soon as I deformed it, um, it, it, it cannot be fixed anymore to that, to that quantity. So in these cases, it's useful to define what's called a distortion strain, which is basically the strain compared with the initial, with the, the uh, at the initial time. And, but the time derivative or the, the dot derivative with respect to this crystal velocity is something that, uh, uh, that is covariantly defined. So it's independent of these transformations that I, or it's invariant under these transformations that I show. And it kind of captures the expansion and shear of this, of this uh, velocity, crystal velocity field. Now, I have to do something else if I want to have this in a controlled hydrodynamic setup, which is I'm not going to allow arbitrary uh, uh, types of reference metrics. So I'm going to focus on the case in which um, I split the reference metric in, in terms of a delta ij plus a small quantity l, which I, I, I take it to be order derivative, times another arbitrary field, psi ij. You can- Jay, there's a question, sorry. There's a question over here by Daniel and Musa. Yeah, here I, uh, okay, yes. In, Go in, which, in which moment have we stated that, uh, we stated that it is a crystal, that it is not an amorphous medium, for example? Uh, well, uh, I'm not a big expert in amorphous versus crystals, but <laughs> but I don't know uh, whether in an amorphous crystal I can also have uh, the crystal fields derive, you know, define the periodic structure. Uh, maybe, maybe I have, maybe, maybe there is uh, such a thing. I, I don't know for sure. Um, I also, there's also questions about the microscopic origin of, of plasticity in that case. In an amorphous crystal, can you really think of plasticity as being mediated by defects? I think that has to do with the fact that the crystal fields exist there, are well-defined or not. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think uh, this is not amorphous, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, I, but I don't know for sure, yeah. Jay, I, Jay, I have a bit of an issue, you know, because a crystal break symmetry. Yes. Right? And uh, it's all governed by the space groups. There are a lot of data out there. I mean, I'm listening to your constructions, right? I've said to see, I know how it, how it about works. But, uh, somehow it, it's hugely incomplete, right? When you're completely blind for the space groups. I mean, a morph system, you can quite identify uh, space groups, blah, blah. And surely when you dig into the full repertoire of existing, you know, the CUE COE of crystals, yes. highly evolved art, there's millions of papers written about it. Eventually you find out that, uh, you know, when you're really dealing with single crystals, these space groups imprint on everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you work in the work, right? You're so general that you don't uh, see it. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> there are the space groups. I, I think there are no space groups. This, you this don't you're, there you're are talking, no space groups. Yeah, you're talking about discrete rotations, all, all this kind of stuff. No, the space group, you break symmetry. A crystal is defined by spontaneous breaking the translational and rotational symmetries of space. 
Yes. That's a very starting point. And yes. from that, you can ascend, you know, and do your geometrical constructions. Yes. And but these this fields, are, these fields which are fine in principle, but, you know, they're blind. You can only, I think, capture isotropic elasticity in this way and no more. I, I, I only capture what, sorry? It's but just it's, it's, Isn't it? The, the space groups are going to be specified by either the reference metric or the specific yeah. value you take for the crystal fields, right? Yeah, you can wire it in, uh, but you have to do, you know, the full tensor uh, 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 gymnastics, right, to, to get it right. Yeah, but this is all here. So I'm just describing crystal fields. Fine. You, yeah, I, I guess this is sort of Euclidean frames whatsoever. You don't have that in uh, Galilean frames. You don't have that in uh, when you're dealing with space groups. There's a lot more structure. There's all what, sir? There's a lot more structure out there, right? So the, you cannot quite dis, discern the difference between amorphous and crystalline. Uh, so, so we discussed that, this also. That is, that is encoded, excuse me, I've been spending 20 years of my life on this. I know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, and, 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 and the difference, the first difference between amorphous and uh, crystalline is not so much in plasticity. I mean, glass is not very plastic. It's in, you know, whether you see the workers of the, of the, of the space groups. Mm -hmm. So, Eric, that's the way it works. It might cause. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I was trying to put it differently. On. So we're indeed yeah. dealing with isotropic space here, in a sense, yeah. because eventually we'll, we'll get to an isotropic momentum space. There is no space group structure here. That's absolutely yeah, yeah. true. Yeah, so, so you but it's it. something that you can wire in later. Yeah, you can. I think you can get something yeah, which I, is on I, the I, agenda. You yeah, can I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't agree. think that, I don't think there's incompatibility here in that. Yeah, especially no incompatibility between, between here and your paper. So we can definitely put this. <laughs> I, I synthesize. Okay, it's not all fundamental criticism. Right? But yeah, yeah, but we can know. include we can include it There's later. More shit to care about, and space groups are shit. There are too many of them, and they are you know messy and. No, no, but we can. <laughs> we have looked a bit into that. It's just I haven't, I haven't put it in here. Yeah, but yeah, we we can talk about it later if you see it later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so, so I, I was I was coming back to this with uh, controlling plasticity, and uh, the the reason why we control plasticity in this way is because if we don't control it at all, then we could end up basically in the phase in which, or from the from the uh, the beginning, we could just start in the phase in which I have gapped everything already, or I had melted the crystal exactly because the plastic metric was just too strong. And if you think about this as, as capturing topological defects, I would have uh, increased the density of to topological defects so much that I had basically re melted the crystal from the beginning. So you can, you can parameterize the reference metric as a sort of de small deviation from the elastic state. And then you can see what happens if you would actually increase this parameter very much, if, if you're interested in what happens in the, in the melted state. So how, how do you describe this uh, in, in equilibrium? Um, now you have to introduce a few more fields. Uh, it's not just the crystal fields anymore or the, or the reference metric, but you also introduce a temperature, a chemical potential, which is a kind of mass chemical potential that describes just the mass density of the, of the, of the crystal, and also a, a velocity field, uh, a fluid velocity field, uh, that, that I call U here. And you can get from uh, this uh, free energy, you can get the thermodynamic uh, relation. So if you, the variation of that pressure can be parameterized in this way, in which S is the entropy dual to the temperature, this is number density, this is momentum. And then there's these elastic and plastic strains that I, I described by Rij and this other Mathcal Rij. And this one here is, is basically the reference metric that I introduced before. There's also here an external stress that I can add. This is just for convenience, is so that I can basically probe correlations of, uh, of, of the strain. So if I apply a stress, I see what happens to the, to the strain. I can probe it by introducing this external object. Now, this is all in equilibrium. 
but of course the 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 goldstone fields or the crystal fields and the and the reference metric they have dynamics even in equilibrium and if i vary this free energy with respect to those fields i do get uh, what's called the, the Goldstone equation of motion or the Josephson equation in equilibrium, and then an equation for the plastic, the plasticity. If I turn this L parameter to zero, that means I remove all plasticity, I just get back normal uh, elasticity with some external sources that I introduced, K okay, external and U external, which are just given in terms of this uh, external stress that is put in here into the free energy. If L is different than zero, then it's actually possible to show that these two equations are not uh, independent. So they're actually just more or less the same equation. And this is because in that case, we can actually use it in, the, in equilibrium. You can use the diffeomorphism uh, symmetry of the crystal space to basically set the plastic metric to be delta ij so in, in in equilibrium there is not a lot of interesting things plasticity is mostly an, a non-equilibrium phenomenon sorry yeah. can you I got a bit lost what is this capital u in the second equation uh, it's just an it's it, this is just a way of writing the equations i get from here by varying with respect to either the goldstone fields the five fields i get this equation uh -huh. and this ki external is is given in terms of combinations of TIJ external. Mm -hmm. I didn't write what it was, but it's only it's just a rewriting in which I put all terms related to TIJ external into this. Okay. Vector. Yeah. And the same thing for UIJ. So they're completely derived from TIJ. So for the sorry, for the second equation, you're variating with respect to the plastic uh, plastic metric. Okay. So yes. there's two there's two dynamical fields here is, is the five is the goldstones and the plastic metric. So. Okay. Thanks. Then it's very uh, uh, common to to focus on on small strings. Uh, so in that case, you can uh, simply expand the pressure in terms of a fluid part. This one is a linear part in the strain that is equal to zero in, in equilibrium if you want mechanical stability though its derivatives are important so we we don't turn the derivatives of this quantity to zero and then this part here is just the elasticity uh, the elasticity tensor contracted with two copies of the strain and of course here i can i can impose all sorts of group structures either isotropic or not uh, they can be included in there here i'm focusing on the isotropic case in which I only have two coefficients, the, the bulk modulus and, and the shear modulus here. Just for future reference, I, 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 I try to give a sense of what that uh, linear term there is good for. And what that linear term gives you is basically um, coefficients of thermal expansion, uh, chemical expansion and, and velocity expansion. So this is how, for instance, the, the the equilibrium or the, the reference state can change with uh, with uh, uh, the effect of temperature or chemical potential. In this case, mass mass potential and, and velocity fields. So this is the standard uh, equilibrium story for, for crystals. There's nothing uh, abnormal here as far as I know. Now, out of equilibrium, I don't know what these equations are. I have no clue what the equations for the goldstone is and what the equations for the uh, plastic metric is. So I basically parameterize my ignorance by some operators that I called Ki and Uij. And I'm going to try to derive what they are. Now, on top of these equations, which I don't know what, what, what they are, I also have conservation laws. I have a conservation law for the energy density. I have a conservation law for momentum, and I have a conservation law for uh, uh, mass density. So these conservation laws or world identities, I didn't pull them out of the hat. I basically derived them from an action. I can construct an action that uh, has all these symmetries, and I can derive the conservation laws using, uh, in this case, Aristotelian geometry. There's nothing strange about this. Can, yeah. can just a, um, yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder about it, right? So um, I think it's dogma or principle 
that we have a genuine uh, plastic uh, medium and you go to its really deep IR, you wait long enough, that is actually indistinguish indistinguishable from a fluid. Right? Yes. The same story, right? That, that mountains where you wait long enough flow yes. like a liquid. Is this encoded in, in uh, the way that it's, you... It's not encoded, but it's derivable. Yeah, that's another way of saying it. When you depart from these equations, you can derive that when you go to the real long time limit that it, it really yes. is... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you will see it uh, explicitly later in the modes and everything. Yeah. I'm listening. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, on, on top of that, uh, uh, we, of course, assume that this is a passive system. It, it, uh, it, uh, uh, it, is, um, it satisfies the second law of thermodynamics, which we describe in this way. So the conservation of the entropy uh, divergence of the entropy current has to be positive semi-definite and this allows to derive what are the allowed terms in these equations that I do not know for instance as you'll see in a moment so I also have to parameterize my ignorance of the various corrections that these fluxes energy fluxes momentum fluxes charge fluxes have so I do that by just some ansatz that I have here now, I also don't pull these ansatz out of the hat. The, the terms that are written here are the terms that I know should be there in equilibrium. And then the terms that I do not know out of equilibrium, I parameterize them by some arbitrary uh, functions here, ki, ji, et cetera. And then I put this into my uh, entropy uh, non-conservation law or, or, and, and, and try to derive constraints on what these things uh, can be. And this is the solution. So this is a solution for the energy flux, for the charge flux, and for the um, uh, correction to the Goldstone equation, Ki, and here for the stress and for the plasticity equation. And it's given in terms of these coefficients times these uh, particular one derivative uh, structures that you see here. Now there's a lot of coefficients, Depending on the symmetry that you take, you remove some of them. And also, if you impose um, on Seiger's relations, there's a specific uh, relations between some of these coefficients. The constraints uh, uh, from the entropy current give you this sort of uh, conditions on the coefficients. And then if you have Galilean symmetry, this thing vanishes. If you have relativistic symmetry, this thing vanishes. So it's not, not all of them. Are, are, are important depending on, on what you're interested in. Now, to get a sense for what all these things are, the best thing to do is to linearize it uh, around an equilibrium state. So basically what I do here, I take uh, a crystal uh, that is just uh, aligned with the X direction at rest. And I, uh, I take a, a, a zero state, a, a state with zero velocity. And I take uh, a state with uh, a fixed uh, chemical potential or constant chemical potential. And I fluctuate around this state in, in this particular way. I add arbitrary fluctuations to these, to, these, uh, 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 to these fields. And I just expand the equations that I have, which are given by these specific combinations that are here, put back into the conservation laws, et cetera, et cetera. I just expand that. And I get a Josephson e equation. So this is a equation for this crystal velocity phi phi, uh, ui phi, which is basically the derivative of the gold, the time derivative of, of, the, of the crystal field. And uh, I get this specific equation, which is known. It has a, a, a longitudinal diffusion. It has a transverse uh, diffusion coefficient. And then it has an extra coefficient, which is uh, proportional to uh, either the the one of the uh, chemical expansion coefficients and, and some other coefficient that appears in this big matrix, which basically parameterizes the response of the of the Goldstone field to uh, uh, spatial derivatives of the chemical potential, and the crystal and the diffusion coefficients are given in the in terms of the various elasticity uh, 
coefficients in this specific way. So this, there's nothing that changes here with compared, you know, by introducing plasticity, plasticity doesn't affect this equation. Now, what plasticity does is affecting the strain evolution. So if you now ask what is the time evolution of the strain, you get various terms on this right-hand side. These terms here, lambda b and lambda g, they're there no matter what. And in, actually, in this specific case, you can actually show that you can redefine the fields in such a way that these coefficients can be set to one. So they're not very important in this case. You see that the Goldstone diffusion coefficients affect this strain um, uh, evolution equation in, in the usual way. But what is uh, sort of uh, different here is that the uh, plasticity effects relax the strain as they should. So there is a relaxation coefficient here, omega b, and there is, which is a bulk relaxation coefficient, and there is a shear relaxation coefficient here. So, so naturally, the plasticity uh, out of equilibrium relaxes the strain. Uh, and, and so if you deform this, if you, if you, if you somehow deform the equilibrium state, it will permanently deform because the metric, the intrinsic metric will evolve in time such that the strain of, in the system will uh, turn, basically become zero at the end of the day because of this relaxation. Can you remind uh, what are they proportional to these relaxations, these capital G and B, I forgot. G is the shear coefficient, the shear moduli. Uh -huh. B is the bulk moduli. Uh -huh. L controls the strain. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so. And these are the coefficients that show up in the in the dissipative matrix. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, if someone is thinking about this uh, uh, attenuation uh, or relaxation attenuation relations, whatever you want to call them, so these coefficients do not have them. They're out of equilibrium. They don't have them. Okay. Now, just I just want to. Make uh, Jay, just I think on your slides with the superior coefficients, you didn't write the eta's, but that's fine. I, mean, that's okay. I didn't write the eta's. Uh, you mean these ones here? In the matrix on the previous slides? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, I forgot. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's true. I only wrote the bulk ones. Yeah, sorry. Uh, should have added them. Yeah. Yes, so, so yeah, sorry, yeah. So I just wanna make a, a quick note about uh, interstitials and, and vacancies. Um, so this is possible to define uh, an interstitial density in flux, which is basically the, the normal density minus some constant M0 and this V. This V is the local volume element of the crystal that I can define using the reference metric in this specific way. And then I can define the, the flux, the interstitial flux also in this specific way using the crystal uh, velocity. And if you use these definitions, you can see right away that there is some interstitial kind of conservation law that uh, on the right-hand side is given in terms of the time derivative or the crystal material derivative of the determinant of, um, of the reference metric. So what this, say, what this tells you basically is that if you want the interstitials to be conserved, you have to require uh, that the, there cannot be any changes in volume due to plasticity. So you have to require this material derivative to uh, vanish when acting on the, on the local volume element. As, as some of you might know, I know that Jan uh, knows very well, this, when you demand this to be zero, this is basically the, the glide constraint. Now, you can uh, uh, also, uh, given these definitions, see what kind of effects you get in these interstitial currents. You can define them in this specific way. It's given in terms of these coefficients, d, transverse and parallel, and it's completely given in, given in terms of Goldstone diffusion. So Goldstone diffusion basically controls the diffusion of interstitials in the crystal. The reason why we know this very well is because we can map this whole system 
to the uh, work of Zipelius, Halperin, and, and Nelson uh, from the 70s and 80s. So like I said before, uh, requiring this interstitial current to be conserved, which means that basically you cannot densify your material, you cannot densify the volume element of the material, that implies that one of these relaxation coefficients has to vanish. This is what the glide constraint gives you. So you basically only have, in these systems that conserve interstitials, you only have shear uh, strain relaxation, but not bulk strain relaxation. Now, I wanna give some insight on the various um, uh, 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 modes that this system exhibits. And there's basically two regimes that you can consider. So this is also related to Yan Zan's uh, question about the uh, long and, and, and uh, uh, long time scales and 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 uh, short time scales. So in the in the solid regime, you can have two different, or in general, you can have two different regimes. So first of all, you have a thermal length scale that sort of defines what the hydrodynamic approximation should be. And then you have the fluctuation length scale, which is set by the wave vector here, K. And you have the length scale associated with the plasticity. So if you're in the scale in which the wave vector is, is much larger than the um, strength of plasticity, then you basically will find a kind of solid with, uh, with uh, uh, sort of uh, softening corrections. So if, if you consider this kind of uh, regime, you will find a transverse sound mode that takes the following form, but now it's attenuated due to this relaxation coefficient, which is just given in terms of the shear relaxation, as you see here. And in the longitudinal channel, you'll find a, a sound and a diffusion mode that is also attenuated due to the relaxation coefficients. I didn't give the exact form here of this omega parallel and omega d, but they are given in terms of combinations of the bulk relax relaxation coefficient and the shear re relaxation coefficient. So this is basically you recover a, a, the spectrum of a solid, but with uh, softening corrections in this regime. Now, you can consider the opposite regime in which the wave uh, vector is much smaller than the than the uh, the strength of plasticity, and this is you can think of it as as if you had sort of proliferated uh, the 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 okay if you, if you think in terms of topological defects as if you prolif or or if you increase the density of defects, but here I'm just controlling the strength of plasticity so to speak, and then there I basically recover a liquid regime. So I have a shear mode given in terms of, of, of this uh, uh, expression. And I also have a longitudinal sound mode of a liquid. But now these coefficients of viscosities and bulk viscosities, et cetera, they get corrections due to the uh, presence of, the, of plastic effects. So it's a kind of, uh, 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 that, that provides some kind of hardening for the, for the liquid. And of course, some other modes get gapped when I send when I when I focus on on this specific regime. Okay. Yes. Your chi L, so it still has a correction from crystal type effects. But if I go, if I imagine going to a truly liquid regime, then shouldn't that be going away? How, how do I see that it will go away? Because I can see that corrections to eta will go yeah. away because omega g will be very large. Yes. Yeah. So what about alpha? What about which one? Sorry? What about alpha? If I just started from the liquid regime, I would just write chi, not chi L, right? If I just assume that I had a liquid. Yes. You're, you're, ah, you're saying, how, how do I see that? Yeah. Um... I guess what, what's behind my question is, can you truly claim that you really interpolate to a like 100% liquid regime or 
do you, do you simply never quite get there starting from this formalism because you can never do away with all the with all of the crystal effects yeah that's um yeah I'm, I'm yeah i'm not yeah i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure uh, yeah i'm not sure how to yeah how to answer that except that you know i could yeah i, I mean i don't know how to answer that completely but of course i, I can recover this I can recover this spectrum <laughs> just by considering a normal fluid with uh, with some uh, with some modified coefficients. Now I don't see. I, yeah, I know. I know that's a bit of a cheat, but I just don't see from this point of view. I don't see any effect of of the crystal fields. I mean, of course, you can say, oh, the specific coefficients as I present here, they have the, they somehow came from there, but at the same time, the the spectrum doesn't show any any signature of the crystal fields so I, I i don't know i think that's that's the best i can do because i i could say you know i just start with some uh, coefficients in this specific way that don't refer the coefficients themselves don't have to necessarily refer to the to to the crystal fields and uh, because they don't they don't depend on it anymore so maybe Maybe also to be in like a truly liquid regime, you need to have your curly L to be much, to be much bigger than the thermal length, than the inverse thermal length, right? Because here, no, yeah, basically the plasticity effects they always need to be small, right? Because because of your condition that curly L is much smaller than one over LT. So you yeah, have that's true. Liquid like, but you can't you, you can't really get to like truly liquid that's true yeah I'll, I'll i'll think a bit better whether i need an assumption on, on that on that one yeah i'll think about it maybe, maybe yeah maybe that's sufficient yeah I'll, I'll think about it thanks yeah okay so i don't know how long i have oh <laughs> well, i mean you had many questions so yeah I, yeah but still <laughs> Okay, I don't know how many slides you like. I, I could. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I, I just wanted to, to give a flavor of the correlation functions. So this is a, a current current correlation function, and, and, and very sadly, because this is what we were hoping to find, uh, the plastic effects don't, uh, don't affect this correlator at, at zero wave number. So when k is zero, uh, you just don't see any, any effect of plasticity in this specific correlator. When k is non-zero, then you do get some effects. And uh, what you can see in this specific uh, uh, graph here is, is, is the, the, the real part of this correlator up, up there. And if you, if you, for instance, if you have, if you're looking at, or you're probing at scales in which this condition holds, so you can think of it uh, morally as, as, as low plasticity, then you do get this peak. This peak is only because of the of the sound mode. But once you probe at the other um, uh, in the other scales in which the the strength is much larger, then basically that peak goes disappears and and you you go back to zero because you basically you 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 remove the sound mode uh, from the spectrum. So this would be something if you could measure this uh, this correlation at, this correlator at finite k. This would be something you could use to probe uh, plasticity. Uh, maybe the most significant probe that you do see, uh, uh, even at zero uh, momentum, is is the strain strain correlator. In this case, is completely given just in terms of the relaxation coefficients uh, in this way. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted, I wanted to discuss some topological defects and, and some uh, pinning results, but I'm not sure if I should continue because uh, I, yeah. You can continue at least, I don't know, 10 minutes more, or is it enough? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, okay, I, I'll just skip this part of topological defects. Uh, I just wanted to make a point here that you can, 
consider the physics or the dynamics of, uh, of singular goldstone fields, as in the way that uh, topological defects are usually introduced. And you can map one to one to this formulation that I showed uh, in terms of a dynamical reference metric because there's some kind of relation between the two. I'll just skip this and, and I'll just refer to the paper for those who want to know about it. So very quickly, I'm just gonna go through uh, adding pinning. Uh, so to, to add pinning effects, you basically, you, you have to explicitly break the translation symmetry. There's like a million ways of breaking the translation symmetry because you can add all sorts of operators that break that symmetry. So I'm focusing on the simplest way of breaking that translation symmetry, which is by adding scalar operators in the background. This is described by these capital Phi I fields. You can think of them as some kind of uh, uh, very analogous to the Goldstone fields as describing some kind of background lattice in which the positions of the lattice background lattice cores are given by these Phi fields. And these Phi fields transform with constant shifts in the same way that the goldstone fields transform with constant shifts. And this construction allows you to write very formally a, a pinning term, so a mass term for the goldstone, as some people like to call it, in which I've introduced here uh, an L prime uh, uh, quantity to control the strength of the pinning. And, and I'm assuming again that this L prime quantity is also very, very small of derivative suppressed. There's no, not any universality argument in, in this case for why this is the, the, the term in the free energy that I can add. I could add millions of terms that are combinations of these things. This is the simplest thing that I can add and, and, and connects very well with classical literature on, on, on pinning. That's the reason for adding this. Now, the conservation laws, they change. They're slightly modified compared to the previous case. The difference is that now there's some operators that are dual to these uh, background fields, and they affect the conservation laws in this precise way. And the procedure now is very similar as before. I have to uh, parameterize my ignorance of the various fields that I don't know, the equation for the goldstone and the equation now, uh, and also the equation for plasticity. And, and also the form of that operator that is dual to the, to the background field. The solution is what you get from the dissipative uh, matrix. Uh, th there's more coefficients exactly because there's, uh, there's one more field in there. And uh, if you go straight to the linearization, now the Goldstone, uh, the Josephson equation has exactly the same terms as before, uh, but now, there's also a, a relaxation term due to the pinning uh, effect, which is given in, in this specific way. There's also a modification of this term of the leading order uh, term of the Josephson equation. The string uh, evolution also changes now, besides the defect terms that are the plasticity terms that were there before and the relaxation coefficients that were there before. Now there's also a term proportional to the, the Goldstone relaxation due to pin, which enters in, in this way with this uh, thing that we call the distortion tensor. These coefficients now, lambda prime and lambda B prime, they're not necessarily one anymore exactly because of the pinning effect. There is a damping attenuation relation that people have uh, uh, looked at before. This damping attenuation relation still holds, but now just for the goldstone relaxation coefficient as before. So it's not affected by, by the, the fact that there is topological or that there's plasticity in, in, in the system. You can play the same game uh, and look at the various regimes. Um, in, this, in the solid regime, you now get a transverse sound mode that is pinned. So there's the pinning frequency over there. And in this channel, the pinning dominates in the sense that it dominates the relaxation. So the relaxation uh, of, of this mode or the attenuation of this mode is given in terms of the shear relaxation coefficient and also the pinning coefficient. But you can see that this is K dependent. 
So this one dominates at uh, at low at, at low k. So the, the the pinning dominates the the relaxation in this case. And there's also longitudinal sound and diffusion here. But here uh, the pinning does not necessarily dominate. In fact, for this diffusive uh, mode, it is still uh, the uh, plasticity effects that dominate the attenuation, while here is a combination of both of them. So there's kind of a competition between these two effects in, in the mode structure. In the liquid regime is slightly different because if you now kind of proliferate the defects, you get a pinned, uh, somehow a, a, a pinned uh, 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 transverse sound because there's still an effect of the pinning frequency over there. And there's also still uh, longitudinal sound and, and diffusion as, as in a kind of uh, liquid, but they're still, still uh, with the pinning frequency over there. So we don't know exactly what to call this phase. We call it a pin, pinned electron liquid, but exactly how to uh, sort of recover that thing from, from a uh, um, from from a sort of uh, more direct approach, as in the other case, one could just think about a normal liquid here. It's not clear to us exactly how to derive this, because there's still some effects of 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 the lattice uh, field somehow. Now, I just wanted to flash this uh, picture because this is one of the differences between having pinning plasticity and no pinning on the left and pinning and plasticity on the right. So if I look at the, at the current current correlator at, at this, if I probe at these scales, I, I see this peak due to the sound mode, but then if I melt or if I increase the plasticity, I still have a peak because that uh, sound mode hasn't uh, completely disappeared because of this uh, structure out here. So you still see peaks after you kind of uh, uh, melt uh, or, or yeah, melt melt the crystal. Okay, so I I, I just want to finish, if I may, uh, in two minutes. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, make a statement about those who would like to uh, uh, look at holographic um, uh, realizations of this story. So in that case, you will you will have to find a kind of boundary action variation that takes this specific form. So you need, of course, to consider a metric, a gauge field, and a field that explicitly breaks the symmetries, but you also need to include dynamical goldstone fields and the dynamical uh, metric, spatial metric. So that would be the tricky part of this thing if you want to describe plasticity. And the word identities are, are you know, uh, easily obtained from that variation, and they have to have this specific form. Now, just for other kinds of questions that this would uh, lead to, there's the question about other regimes. I didn't uh, exactly say, but I, I kept the pinning strength to be of the same uh, strength as the momentum in my fluctuations. I could play around with different strengths for both pinning and plasticity effects and see what kind of phases are possible. Uh, there's the question of whether any of these sort of uh, uh, correlators can be measured in actual experimental setups. There's also the interesting question of unidirectional symmetric crystals. So these are related to unidirectional charge density waves, which I studied quite a lot. The, the, the theory is a little bit more complicated because now it's uh, an isotropic. There's a, a vector in the game and, and there's a lot more coefficients to play with. Then there's also a question of a symmetry understanding of these topological defects. Uh, how do you, here I just spit out the dynamical reference metric, but may, and I didn't give any symmetry argument for where that metric comes from. Maybe there's another way to describe that. And then there's also the question of how to include uh, disconnections in this theory. I didn't descri describe disconnections at all, only these locations. Then there's also the question of how to combine this with uh, electromagnetic fields and, and consider uh, plasmon excitations. And then in general, just other phases of matter, the ones that I mentioned before, including uh, spin density waves uh, and, and superconductivity with, with all these uh, different fields mixed in. So yeah, I stopped there. Uh, thank you. 
Thanks a lot of Jake, very nice talk. <clears throat> We've had some questions, but of course I, I expect more. Please don't be shy. Well, I have one. Okay, yeah, you have one. Too. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, essentially, I, I guess I'm asking to expand the, the, the part that you skipped, uh, the relation between the defective the singular configurations of the fields and the, the reference metric. Because for example, one thing that I was not able to see was uh, the movement of uh, this location that should be constrained to be along the Burgers vector is something that I, I should have uh, recognized at some moment. Or... Uh, but that's that's when I briefly mentioned the glide constraint. Right, right. Yeah. yeah so if I if I impose that glide constraint, which is this condition here, then you restrict you restrict that. But it, but this is a restriction that is imposed on the system. Even if you if you if you describe the theory using the singular goldstone fields you will still have to impose the glide constraint it doesn't come automatically yeah. i see so uh, yeah it's completely analogous i mean i should say that doing it with uh, with the singular goldstone fields you get more than what i have because i'm only basically considering the symmetric part of these crystal frame fields that you see here there can be anti-symmetric parts which are related to anti-symmetric tensor, uh, anti-symmetric strain, and that captures the the sort of deformations of the bond angles in the crystal. So that that is not included here in my theory of plasticity. I would have to generalize that theory of plasticity to include plasticity in the bond angles, and then I could map it one to one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you could say this is a subsector of this. Yeah. I guess it is related also to disclination that you mentioned. Then, then you could introduce disclinations and all that kind of story if you if you turn on these degrees of freedom. Yeah. Okay, thanks. More questions? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. It's it's related to the expressions you get for the plastic rates, omega G and omega B. So you express them in terms of some transport coefficients that you suggestively call eta h and zeta h, I think. Yes, here, yes. And that is, so as you know, there, there's this all result by, I don't know, off the top of my head, I no longer remember in which paper it is, whether it's in the Zipelius paper or in Costa yeah, I think it should original be papers that yeah. relate those rates to the shear and fog viscosity of the normal state inside the dislocation cores. Uh -huh. Is there any way that I can think of these relations in that light, or I, I, I don't think so, but I thought I would ask. I, I do not, I haven't looked at that question. Maybe I should have also read your paper a bit better because I know you have this relation there, but uh, I, uh, I, I, and the Zipelius, but I do not know. I do not, I, uh, I, I would have to look at it. I do not know if you can see it. Yeah, in our paper, we just re-derive it using the Yeah, I, I know, but, I, but we don't have anything there's no new relation compared to the literature of the 70s yeah and and, and and there's no new relation here either because this i mean the only thing that we have done here was to uh, describe it using a, a reference dynamical reference metric but at the end of the day we're just recovering zipelius <laughs> so 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 we're not uh, yeah maybe not i mean because you see, this uh, the, the expressions you have for omega G and omega B, I guess what I'm asking is, is, is it just a parametrization or should I try to think of this eta H and zeta H somehow as capturing the shear viscosity of the normal state inside the crystal core? Or, or does this necessitate one more calculation, which is the memory matrix type calculation where you simply, you know, uh, write what is omega g in terms of a Kubo formula, use the fact that there's an L squared sitting in front so that you can evaluate the Kubo formula in the normal state. Right. Yeah, I, I, I never looked at that, so I do not know. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I mean, the, the reason why I'm asking is also because since the, the pinning diffusion relation came out of the entropy positivity arguments, so one might have hoped that the, those relations from the Zipelius papers might also come out in the, in the plastic case too. 
yeah. without needing to do one more one further calculation. I see. Yeah, I I anyway. I, you know, I understand the question. I I I think uh, the answer is that I will figure it out <laughs> because I uh, I am looking at the Zipelius construction, and I'm not sure if then the Zipelius construction is uh, for the specific result you're saying whether it's um, because I'm having a specific realization of this plasticity or or whether it's going to hold in general for any kind of plasticity. That I don't I don't have the I don't have the answer. But I, I, I guess that it's going to be very much related to the Zipelius construction. Because as far as I understand, you know, this theory that people have also suggested to describe gels, which have nothing to do with, uh, which plasticity has nothing to do as being mediated to topological defects, is still described by these degrees of freedom in terms of strain. So, so I would expect that this is a little bit more general and not necessarily having these relations but i will it will take me a bit to figure that out yeah and i maybe have one more technical question it had to do with how you introduced the tij x external in your pressure functional the, the tij yeah yeah yes, yes. Yeah. on this slide yes so K and U, they're both, at the end of the day, they, they have some expression in terms of T external. Uh, K, yeah, so, so K and K, I and U, I are just defined as whatever you get in terms of T yes. external by when you do the variation, yeah. But in your previous, I mean, at least in, in one of your previous papers, you were directly writing K inside your free energy. So why, yeah, but why, my previous why, why not do that here and the same for you? Uh, well, I, 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 I uh, so here I actually can do that because the uh, we, we're just being pedantic here because uh, in, in in general uh, you could say this is the case, but then the diffeomorphism symmetry uh, basically obliges uh, you to have the difference between the two. So we're just being pedantic. You are and and you're right that this. Is a little bit of a, a non consistent pedantic because here I already uh, sort of said that at least to what uh, external sources are concerned, I should couple to the diffeomorphism invariant field, which is kappa ij. Mm -hmm. So, so you're you're right uh, that uh, I should I should you know I could have just said kappa ij inside that thing, but uh, so at but the end no, of the day, your pressure your pressure functional is just a function of kappa ij. So yeah, it is. It is because yeah, you in the paper you can see that when we impose the diffeomorphism constraints on the on the on the pressure uh, functional, you basically get that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So somehow, like also in the first law. Yeah. Here. So, so this is no this is before imposing separately yeah. varying h capital i capital j and uh, bar yeah, and h. then and then it's only after this that we actually impose the the relation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other question? Okay, as usual, then um, we officially close the session and then I ask again if there are some comments, but uh, if there is some final question before then, please go ahead. Okay, otherwise, otherwise, let's thank uh, Jay again. Thank you very much. And uh, see you all next week. I think next week we will have the talk slightly earlier because uh, the speaker is far east. So thanks again, Jay, and see you all next week. Nice.